Okay, there we go. So sharing a life with co-UCL alumni. And I did my PhD. I finished it in 84. I started with the MA in 1978. So I was actually four or five years in London. So I know the environment where all of you studied and it was a great pleasure. My early years, start, actually before I went to London, I'm trying to figure out now how do I move the screen. There we go. 67 to 78. I, I finished University of Toronto in 67. I got on a train to Vancouver, flew to Hong Kong, and I lived in Hong Kong for 11 years as a Lung teacher. And probably you'll know from history, these were the years of the Cultural Revolution. When I arrived in Hong Kong, I even saw one or two people planting bombs. I saw a tremendous conflict. And so that was really what caused me to say, what should I study? How can I figure out what caused this conflict? What was cultural about the Cultural Revolution? That was kind of my question. Most people see it as a political battle, which of course it was, but underneath were deep, deep cultural roots. So I taught in the secondary school and I just gave you one picture. This is my Chinese mom. I moved in with her in 1968. I lived in her home for six years. I kept in touch with her for the next 40 years. She passed away in 2014. And you can see what a beautiful face. When I live with her, she had five children. Her oldest son was in Taiwan. She had three children in mainland China. She had a daughter born in Hong Kong who was my student. None of them could see each other. It was a totally separated family. And the reason I moved in with her was because she lost her husband. He disappeared and she had no knowledge what happened. He was pulled into China during the Cultural Revolution. He had been a general with the Nationalist Party, so he was seen as an enemy by the Communist Party, and he was in prison for six or seven years. The good news is he did come out in the end. I actually met him. I met the son in Taiwan. She was able to visit the children in China, but only after Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978. So in many ways, I learned more from her than I learned from all the history books. Uh, that I read. She as a young girl grew up in Tianjin. She even met Sun Yat-sen, the famous leader of the Chinese revolution. But she had gone through all of the upheavals, Japanese invasion, the civil war, the revolution when she had to get out and leave her children behind, then the cultural revolution when she lost her husband. So my deep question when I decided to, after this um, 11 years in uh, Hong Kong to go and do my master's degree and then do my PhD in London was what underlay all of this conflict? What was cultural about the Cultural Revolution? I felt I need to study and understand China and all the conflicts of it, of its recent history and its opening up. So in 78, I went to London. It was kind of natural. I had studied at the University of Hong Kong and also the Chinese University. I learned Cantonese, I learned Mandarin. I got a, a certificate for teaching. And then 78, I moved to London and did my master's degree in London. But I, once I got there, almost the first thing I did was go to the Chinese embassy and say, by, by any chance do you need teachers in China? Because this was just after Mao died and Deng Xiaoping had come to power and he said, China will be open to the world modernization in the future. The, the Chinese embassy told me, yes, indeed we do. Fudan University in Shanghai wants an English teacher. Are you ready to go? So I did my master's, I hadn't quite finished it. And I enrolled in a PhD program <clears throat> and started the coursework. And then I was allowed to have a two year leave of absence from my doctoral studies to go to Shanghai and live there from 1980 to 1982. So I'm going on to the next slide now. That was such an interesting interesting time. Many of my students had been sent down to the countryside for as long as 10 years. They'd seen the horrors of the Cultural Revolution. These are some of the teachers that I taught with. And I, I mention it, sadness behind the smiles. So they're smiling, but they had been through horror in the Cultural Revolution. The students, it was different. They were so happy to be able to come back and to be able to study. So it was a wonderful two years that I spent in Shanghai. And I did my doctoral research by finding the archives and the history of Fudan University, which had very interesting roots, both from France and also from America. And I was trying to look at how did the French and American patterns integrate with deep-rooted Chinese 
cultural values? And how could it be possible for China's universities to avoid this kind of conflict in future? So now we come to what did I think caused the Cultural Revolution? It was Soviet socialist imperialism. It wasn't the Germans or the French or the Americans who had come at different times and never totally controlled China. The Soviets moved in in 1952. They put in place a very mechanistic, specialized, narrow system of macro planning that totally went against Chinese culture. And what I saw was this was culturally simply unacceptable. And so they were thrown out. It doesn't mean the Cultural Revolution was a solution. It sure wasn't. It was very violent and it was very destructive to the society. But that was my search to try and understand. So I went back to London. I'll tell you about this slide in a minute. In 19, um, I studied in 1982, I finished my PhD in 84. And I was looking at when China opens up, I wanted to predict when its universities could integrate ideas from France, from UK, from America, from abroad, but build it on their own foundation. So there wouldn't be another outburst such as the Cultural Revolution. I finished the thesis in 84. I went back to Canada. I became a postdoc. I got a position as assistant professor, which was uh, very exciting at the University of Toronto. And then suddenly I get a tap on the shoulder. We need somebody in the Canadian embassy in Beijing. This is 1989. This is December 88, January 89. Are you willing to be loaned by the university to the Canadian government to go to Beijing and be the cultural counselor for the Canadian embassy? At first I said, no, I love teaching. Why would I want to do that? And then I thought, oh, very interesting opportunity. When I decided I had no idea about the Tian Tiananmen massacre. In fact, I was in, I took this picture. This, this bus says, Li Peng stepped out, and it comes from the Chinese Academy of Science. This was a huge protest against the government, which ended, as you know, in a tragedy when many students were killed and things were shut down. And so I was in China beforehand. I saw that, and then I went back for two years. Canadian government and Chinese government were not on speaking terms in that time. But my job was to do people to people relations. That's what I did. I went to universities. I went I put up Canadian films. I talked to writers. I managed the Canadian government. It expanded its cultural programs. They said the writers and the students and the scholars are victims of Tiananmen. We will let more of them come and we'll send Canadians to China. So it was a very wonderful time in which I was really able to see how people to people relations could deepen understanding even when the governments were not speaking. And then I left China and uh, came back in 1991 and settled back down into my teaching job. But I learned so much from that time uh, as a cultural attache, actually. That's, that was the formal title that I had. Came back to Canada, settled down into my teaching, thinking, I'm not going back again. I've got to get on with my academic work. And I've trained many doctoral students. And suddenly 1997 comes along and you know that was also a big year of transition. That's when Hong Kong returned to China. And Hong Kong had felt like a second home to me because I always traveled through it when I was working in China. Over the years after I worked in the embassy, I supported many Canadian development projects supporting Chinese universities to recover from the Cultural Revolution. In many areas, agriculture, we produce canola, medicine, management, all the first MBAs were from Canadian universities. Environment was a huge topic. And education, we did joint doctoral programs. So it's doing that over the years and also working with the World Bank to some extent. And then suddenly, Hong Kong says to me, we, got a new we want to build a new university for teachers. Will you come back? and be the director for us. Well, of course, I had to go through a lot of briefing and so on. And I hesitated again a lot. I didn't have the ambition to be a university president, but I had certain qualifications. I spoke fluent Cantonese, which is a local dialect of Hong Kong. I spoke fluent Mandarin. I lecture in Mandarin all over China and different universities. And so the role was to help Hong Kong connect to particularly the normal universities in China, which are often also called education universities. And Hong Kong had expanded its higher education and left teachers behind. So teachers were being trained in one or two year short scale programs and very few of them held degrees. And the Hong Kong people felt, 
you know, the British colonial government really didn't do justice to our education system. We have to upgrade it. We have to have teachers with qualifications with a Bachelor of Education and above. So here's a beautiful campus that I got to help build and also lead. And it's now the Education University of Hong Kong in a beautiful hilly area. It's called the Hill of the Eight Immortals, right near the border of China. Very modern and beautiful campus and beautiful buildings. It First degrees were offered in 2001. I went in 97. It got self-accrediting status in uh, two. 2004. And finally, in 2016, it got the title Education University of Hong Kong. And I'm the president emerita. And it's my second home. I have an endowed apartment. I go back all the time. And it's just been wonderful to see the Asian emphasis on education as a very high status field. The Western University tends to treat education as somewhat low status. After all, it's in interdisciplinary, it's applied, it's very locally oriented. Law, medicine, engineering have much more status, but not in Asia. Not only Hong Kong and China, but also Korea, Japan, education institutions have a high status coming from the Confucian tradition, which greatly emphasizes uh, the importance of education. So that was just a fantastic period of time. I lived there from 1997 to 2002. I saw it develop. You'll guess that my heart aches for Hong Kong now, uh, particularly with the recent national security law and the uh, impositions upon it. But you know, I, there's a strength there. I believe they will re, uh, they will uh, persist through that, and they will adapt. And I've seen all over China. What you see from Beijing doesn't reflect what's actually happening in different regions. There's a lot of incredible resistance and autonomy, in spite of a very intrusive and repressive regime at the present time under, under Xi Jinping. That, that's my own kind of observation about it. So I just wanted to share with you, that was a very exciting period of time, 97 to 2002. And I go back every year. I have an endowed apartment. I get involved in many of their programs. It was just a very exciting time of cooperation and collaboration and really recognizing how the richness of China's educational heritage can be um, connected with our Western patterns. Both have strengths which can enhance one another rather than one seeing as superior to the other. And I really experienced that. So I just mentioned that we had all these projects. The Canadian government helped China over about 20 years. The agreement was signed in 83. Many, many areas. Canola is now a bigger export product for Canada than wheat. And it was developed in cooperation with Chinese scientists under these projects back in the 1990s. So there are many uh, wonderful examples of that collaboration. And in, in um, 2014, we had a huge conference. It was a much happier time of Canada-China relations at a top university, Tsinghua, where we brought the leaders from 11 universities in China and 12 universities across Canada in all these different fields, management, agriculture, geography, environment environment, education, medicine, minority studies, all these different areas. We involved indigenous peoples also in that um, to, to reflect on those projects and their results. And here's the book that came out of it. The book was published by McGill Queen's University Press, Canadian Universities in China's Transformation. Many Canadians don't know about it. Many Chinese remember because they remember what a difference it made, even though now, of course, they are the aid givers. This was a time when they really needed aid and Canada was the only Western country to give substantial development aid in the first decade after the Cultural Revolution. So I'm just very happy to share with you these experiences I had, which give me hope for the future in a very difficult time. And the last point I would emphasize, history makes a huge difference. In my case, I look back 54 years to 1967, and I see that how conflict was resolved. I see the changes that took place. Nobody expected Deng Xiaoping. I was in Hong Kong when Mao died. We thought, oh, it's gonna go downhill from here. 
And then out comes Deng Xiaoping and opens China in the most remarkable ways. And I've just seen those kinds of changes. So I'm very hopeful for the future, even though I'm also wary. I love the culture. I'm not comfortable with the regime, but I feel the culture is something very rich and powerful. And I'll just end up with what I'm working on now. Here you see a beautiful campus in China where Western and Chinese features are integrated. Chinese buildings, a bell tower, but it has a clock, which is a Western feature. Chinese main building with dormer windows. It looks like Paris, not China. So it was possible. And you have many beautiful campuses in China where Western features and Chinese features are beautifully integrated. This is the campus of a Christian university shut down in 1952 by the communist government. And there were 16 of them. They had a huge contribution to China's development before the communist period. The communists condemned them as cultural imperialism and closed them, gave them to other universities and normal universities. But scholars in China now, historians, sociologists, educators, and others are still writing about the lessons in the liberal arts, in women's education, in university service to social development that they learn from those universities. 70 years later, they are not forgotten. So I guess I'll just end by saying history is very key when we think about China's relations with the Western world. And I was lucky to have those six years in London, which gave me a chance. I looked at archives, both in the University of London, there's a lot of rich materials, and also in the Chinese university where I was working in order to reflect on and understand the interaction between Chinese universities and Western universities and how they could be harmonized. So I'm gonna close there and hand over back to Nikki uh, and Gregory, and we can open up to discussion. I'll I'll get rid of the screen now so you we can all see each other. It would be nice if some people could put on their video so we can see more faces too, right? It's kind of fun to be able to see the faces. So thank you very much, uh, Vicki and Gregory for arranging this. It's my great pleasure to be with you and I'll be very happy to enter into any um, sharing and discussion.